All right. Good evening, guys. Thank you very much for uh, for joining this evening. Um, this is not the first time I've done a power hour. I've done a, a bunch of them. And uh, the one that we're going to be focusing on today is some of the lessons and things that I wish I knew before I started trading or when I started trading. Um, I've obviously been involved with, with markets for a long time. Um, and there's a lot of things that, you know, it takes sort of a while to learn or you learn the hard way, if that makes sense, right? Um, so let's just look at some of the things that we've covered before in some of the previous uh, sort of power hour presentations. Um, and all of these presentations are both available on just one lab's website, as well as my website, um, as well as YouTube, right? Um, so in the previous presentations, we covered sort of daily routines of, of uh, you know, professional slash uh, day trading. Um, we've also looked at sort of some practical trading setups and some rules, building strategies, uh, some of the psychology that goes into trading successfully. Trading psychology is actually a very, very big part of this whole thing. Um, and that's one of the lessons, ironically, I wish I'd learned before I started or, or earlier on. Um, in any case, also risk management uh, is another one and then developing your own trading plan, right? Um, so copies of these presentations are all obviously available on various different places on the internet. Uh, and this presentation today kind of slots in um, before all of the others, right? So this is more of a sort of aimed at a, a, the beginner trader, uh, people who are newer to the market and some of the things that you might not want to know, but you need to know, right? So a lot of the stuff maybe today um, might not be fun to hear, uh, but it's probably important for you to hear, if that makes sense. Um, so I would really recommend that you go through some of the other presentations. You can download the slides and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, one of the sort of major things, I think, that I just I reiterated this at the beginning of my, my previous presentation as well, is that there's no easy way to do this, right? You get what you put in. It is a lot of work and it does take a long time to really, um, you know, get very good at this, right? So uh, internet marketing and, and, and all sort of stuff, I mean, we see with the pop rise in popularity of stuff like uh, apps like Robinhood and, um, you know, the whole GameStop saga that happened a little while ago. Uh, trading is this very, portrayed as this very sexy thing, but the truth is it takes a lot of work and a lot of people enter into the marketplace thinking that, you know, they, um, that this is somehow going to alleviate their financial stresses and pressures because, you know, there's this guy on the internet telling me that if I just follow his three easy steps, I'm going to be a millionaire by next week, Tuesday. And the reality is it doesn't really work for that. There's no such thing as easy money. And you really have to work very hard if you want to, to do this for a living, right? Um, so, okay. So some of the things we're going to cover today is basically just, uh, uh, you know, the principle that there's no such thing as like quick, easy money. No course that you're going to do um, is going to teach you how to make money very easily or very quickly. Um, and trading is definitely not a way for you to, to sort of get rich fast, right? You can, if you are successful at it, um, you know, make some money over time, but it does take much longer than what people generally anticipate. Um, also, you need to have sort of a secure financial base before you start. The, the, the stresses and pressures of uh, money, essentially, um, weighs on the way that we make decisions. And if you're in a stress situation or under some sort of pressure, then generally you make decisions from a space of desperation rather than a space of opportunism or of, of opportunistic thinking or of opportunism and that generally leads to um, a bad time right uh, so as i mentioned a few times it takes a really long time for you to to know what you're doing and primarily you know successful speculative trading is really more down to the way that you think rather than the things that you know if if that makes sense right uh, so we're going to look at some of the key ingredients that it takes to be a successful trader. Uh, we're going to need look at something, uh, I guess, you know, that I'm the need money versus make money feedback loop, right? So these are some of the emotional feedback loops that we go through um, and how they uh, how they play out. Um, there's also, I say not all pyramids are bad. Please don't quote me on that. Most pyramid schemes are bad, but uh, this is sort of just a asset type uh, principle. Um, and the tortoise always wins the race, right? So it's something that if you are willing to work at it over a long period of time, you will eventually be successful. The, the reality is most traders fail. Um, 
for a number of reasons, lack of discipline being another one, unrealistic expectations is another one, and also because they're trying to make money, you know, in far forward rather than playing the long game, right? Um, so I think the major takeaway from today is that if you want to sort of enter into markets and start trading, you have to really understand what it is that you're getting yourself into. Uh, and you also have to accept that you have to crack a few eggs to make an omelet, right? There's no such thing as a free lunch. It takes many years of study to become a doctor. Um, and likewise, it takes a lot of sort of experience to become consistently successful and consistently profitable as a trader. And unfortunately, the, the best way to get that experience is to burn your fingers and to lose a bit of money. So um, it is a bit of a journey and we'll, we'll get to that sort of, uh, sort of throughout the course of the presentation. So um, the first thing I think, you know, when I entered into markets, uh, you know, obviously I did some courses and I, I paid a, a huge amount of money for a, uh, for a trading course, which turned out to be a 200 page PDF and a piece of software that I had to pay off over three years. And, um, you know, a lot of that time that the salespeople of these educational institutions or primarily these days, it's more on the internet, you know, uh, signal services or YouTube ads. What was that guy's name? Jason Bond picks. Um, you know, they make it look really easy, as simple as you think it is. So, you know, it's not a, it's not as glamorous either as this lifestyle that they put on Instagram where I'm just always in luxury cars with big watches and duffel bags full of cash. I mean, nobody lives like that in, in reality, right? Um, the truth is that if you look at people who become full-time traders, uh, a, a study was done, actually, a, a statistical study was done tracking uh, a relatively large number of traders, um, which is a presentation that that we've covered before in the past. And you know, the, the finding of the study was that only something like zero point four percent of traders, um, you know, that they tracked over the space of three years, were actually making enough money to to call it making a living. Everybody else was making less than minimum wage or losing money. And um, I mean, the vast majority of them were losing money. The, only a very small percentage. It was something like uh, three out of almost 20,000 people that were making money and the rest were, were either struggling, uh, sort of hovering around zero, with the majority of them obviously uh, on the negative end of that equation, right? Um, so that is something that is very important to, to recognize. So if you're thinking of sort of like, you know, giving up the day job or, you've, uh, you know, COVID has negatively impacted your employment situation, aka you've lost your job, you've got some savings, and now you're going to trade for income. Um, but the odds are really stacked against you. And I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying that to become part of that 0.24% takes a tremendous amount of effort. Um, and that's not the way that it's marketed for you to open your, your binary options trading account, right? And you shouldn't be trading those anyway. Um, also, trading can be can be very stressful, right? Um, if you're in a bad position and it's going against you, and you know you maybe didn't close it at the end of the day, and overnight the market's falling, all that stuff can create a lot of anxiety. It can be very stressful, um, and it can be very uh, taxing on your relationships with people and your own sort of health and all that type of stuff. Particularly if you're taking more risk than what you can afford. That's generally why it is stressful when you're in situations where you're taking way too much risk uh, for your actual ability to take risk, right? Um, sorry, I said a typo here, a long more work. It's a lot more work than what you, than what you realize. Um, it takes a lot of studying, it takes a lot of reading, um, and it takes a lot of time to do this, right? So like I mentioned, I mean, maybe it's not quite the same as becoming a doctor, but you know, if you go into a professional career, it takes, many years of study before you are deemed proficient. Um, and likewise, is this, uh, you know, this is the same case with, as with, with trading, because you, know, you can't just sort of enter and do a, a course over a weekend and think, you know, next week I start making 100% return a month. Um, it takes a long time to, uh, to get that right. And it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of sort of introspection and, and work on your own uh, sort of emotional shortcomings and self-awareness, right? Uh, it can also be relatively lonely because once you've been trading for a while, 
you know, the market puts you through all sorts of emotional turmoil. Um, a lot of the time, you know, you get really excited sometimes, you get really scared sometimes, and there aren't actually a lot of people that can identify with that or understand what you're going through. If you say to someone, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm trading and, um, you know, I'm trying to make some money doing this stuff, 90% of them are going to go, oh, so you're gambling. You know, so when you go through difficult times or you're stuck in a rut with trading or whatever, it's very difficult for you sometimes to find people who can actually relate to what you're going through and give you guidance because not a lot of people uh, really have experience with this stuff, right? Um, and despite all the, the, the excitement and the, the sort of allure of this sexy lifestyle that you can get as a trader, um, if you're trading well, it's actually kind of boring, right? Because you're never taking too much risk. You're never, uh, you know, in a situation where um, it's make or break on any one individual trade. And it becomes very routine based, right? You have certain things that you look for and certain rules that you follow. And if the, all the boxes are ticked, then you can take a trade. Um, and that sometimes, you know, it's not as exciting as this, as you see in the movies. It's not the Wolf of Wall Street where you, uh, you know, get these crazy opportunities all the time. Most of the time, it's, you know, a lot of routine based stuff that you have to do and analysis and following rules and that kind of stuff. And that's how you do it successfully. And that is, uh, can sometimes be a little boring. Well, maybe not boring. I guess it depends if that's the kind of stuff that you enjoy doing, then it won't be boring for you. But compared to what it looks like in the movies, it's absolutely not the same, right? I think um, just to reflect a little bit on the on the people that I've met uh, throughout the years and the, and the people that I know and, and have traded with and so on, um, the primary goal that most of these guys have is to find ways to generate higher returns by taking less risk. Right. Everybody realizes that um, what we do as traders is innately risky. Um, and as time goes by, they become less willing to kind of, you know, bet the farm on just one idea. Right. So they try to find more creative ways to to generate return or take return from the market without overexposing themselves to risk. Right. The aim really for most guys is in the most of the successful guys is to be uh, consistent, right? Nobody's trying to make a million bucks today. Uh, everybody's trying to sort of just make enough to eat, you know, and that consistency sort of um, adds up over time, right? You compound those small winners and before you know, you actually have something, something relatively big. Uh, so this trying to shoot the lights out in a single day is, is really just kind of uh, reckless, right? So they never put themselves in a position where if any of their trades or any of their ideas goes wrong, that is going to do lasting damage to them. So uh, risk management is one uh, aspect of that, but also this like acknowledgement of, well, you know, I can't actually take a huge risk. I mean, sometimes you do take trades that have amazing risk reward ratios and you can make a significant amount of money on them, but they're not sort of, you're not looking for those the whole time. What you're looking for is a consistent, method consistency of method consistency of thought consistency of action and that over time culminates in in uh, successful sort of trading right um so as mentioned i guess for the millionth time trading is not easy right um and the real success to to trading or the real uh, key ingredient i think for people to become successful at trading is a very keen sense of self-awareness right um is more about controlling yourself and your actions than what it is about trying to make money, right? And understanding, um, you, you know, how you make decisions. Because when we're under pressure, we make some of the worst decisions possible. Um, a good example of this is, say, for example, uh, you know, your goal is to make 10,000 Rand by the end of the month, and you need to, you know, use that money to pay rent, and you've only made 3,000. Now you've got two days left, you've got to make seven grand. And suddenly you start taking excessive risk because you become desperate for this for this money that you that you need, right? And that's obviously you start making very, very bad decisions. So when you're under pressure um, or under sort of emotional turmoil of sorts, you start your the, the quality of your decision making deteriorates. And in those situations, you need to be self-aware enough to first understand, okay, this is what's happening to me on an emotional level. Um, 
and this is what I need to do to either bring myself back to a state of emotional neutrality, or if I can't do that, I need to walk away, right? I need to, I need to uh, stop trading for a day or two or a week or whatever the case is and come back when I can think a bit more clearly. Um, also, you know, sometimes you do all the homework, you put in all the research, you put on the trade and, and you're just wrong, right? Um, so it's okay to be wrong. In fact, it's, it's okay to be wrong most of the time. Well, maybe not most of the time. Well, yes, yeah, most of the time. More than 50% of the time, you can be wrong. You can be wrong 70% of the time. It, and that's fine, right? Uh, it's a bit counterintuitive because we're all taught that being wrong is wrong. But in this context, in the, in the, in the market, you're going to be wrong all the time and you have to be okay with that, right? Um, what's not okay is to stay wrong or to lose a lot of money when you are wrong. Right, so you can be in a trade, you think, okay, cool, I want to be short gold fields uh, for these and these and these reasons, and bang, you get stopped out. That's fine. It's not a problem. What's wrong, or what what is a mistake, is when the trade that you're short now reaches your stop loss, and you think, ah, you know what? Maybe it'll come right. Um, maybe I should hang on. Maybe I'll just move my stop loss up a bit, and then your loss gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and that is not okay. Right, so you have to sort of accept that being wrong is 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 part and parcel uh, of the game, right? Um, also, if you're not focused on what you're doing, you shouldn't be doing it, right? So you shouldn't be trading if you are, um, you know, emotionally up, like compromised or upset, or if you're tired, you haven't slept well, or you're hungover, or you're busy doing other things and you're multitasking, and you know somebody says, oh, you know, here's a great trading opportunity, and you don't look and you take a trade. Um, without sort of following your own process, that is is definitely uh, a killer, right? So if you're not really focused on what you're doing, you shouldn't be doing it. And it's okay to not trade every day or every week even, uh, rather trade or interact with the stock market when you are in a position to do so responsibly and in a position where you can follow your rules, right? And things change fast, man. Like if you look at what happened uh, last year, for example, with that COVID crash, um, you know, January, the market was trading at record highs. February it got a little soft. March completely cracked, right? And we had a huge, uh, very fast, very sudden move. And that obviously turns a lot of people bearish because now you start thinking, well, geez, the world is busy ending. Everything's going on lockdown. Coronavirus is going to uh, really wreak a, a lot of havoc. And before you know it, the market's trading at all-time highs again. And if you weren't able to sort of quickly uh, or at least fast enough, uh, change your mindset or have a set of rules that dictates, okay, I can no longer be bearish, I need to change to be bullish, um, that can be a bit of a challenge. So you have to be sort of okay with the idea that almost anything is possible at almost any given time, right? Um, an example I like to make here is, you know, what are the odds of an alien spaceship landing in your backyard and complaining that the McDonald's on Earth is worse than the McDonald's on their planet? I mean, it's infinitesimally small, but it is possible, right? It's ridiculous as it sounds. You have to be open to if that really happens. You you can't say, well, this isn't happening. It's 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 playing out in front of you. So you have to be sort of flexible in this mindset that anything is really possible at any given moment, right? Um, and particularly in the market, things can change really fast. Like for example, uh, a stock is trading poorly for the day. It's down two percent. Uh, some news comes out and the thing pops up and it ends the day 15% up. You know, if you aren't able to accept that, you know, even though it seems completely irrational to you that it is in fact happening, um, it's it's a bit challenging to uh, to survive as a trader. You have to sort of stay open to the idea that, that things are, are uh, changing. And this also sort of ties into that emotional side of it because, you know, let's say you're in a short position and this particular situation plays out, for you to now accept that you're wrong, number one, is, is very difficult for humans to do generally. Um, and to be to get yourself out of that sort of shock situation into a situation where you can act rationally again um, takes quite a bit of sort of discipline and uh, you sort of really have to know how to how to control the way that your your head works, right? Um, so that's something that I that I think is relatively, relatively important. Also, you know, when we start out, we don't necessarily realize exactly how much there is to learn. So there's a bookshelf of, of a lot of things on here. Um, 
and I mean, I would argue that the amount of books you see here is probably only 1% of the stuff that you need to know if you want to do this, right? So before you start placing money at risk, I think it's important for people to sort of understand the macro environment in which they're operating, right? Financial markets are complex instruments. Uh, the, the participants in the market are complex. So I'll, I'll go through some of them, right? So what's, um, I think an important starting point is to understand, you know, how does the monetary system work? How do interest rates work? How do, um, how does the, the fractional reserve banking uh, system work? How does policies and money supply influence asset prices? Um, how does international trade and cross-border trade and uh, those types of things influence the price of, or, you know, the values of currencies and how those currencies influence the, the price of commodities? Um, for example, if you look at interest rates in the US, suddenly it's really topical because interest rates are going up. What does that do for equity valuations? What does that do for, for commodity prices? What does it do to gold? Um, you know, what is the effect of additional stimulus coming into the market? So understanding how, you know, the, the, the entire system fits together and what the roles of the, the financial institutions and the banks and exchanges and clearinghouses are uh, sort of on a functional level uh, is very important because it helps you understand more about the animal that you're kind of dealing with, right? Um, it's one thing trading Forex on, the, on an app. It's another thing understanding, you know, how banks trade Forex with one another and how Forex, you know, the value of a currency is, is determined and influenced and by what, right? And why people, banks train, trade Forex with each other and how these transactions are done. Um, is, is very important to understand because it gives you a good grounding of, of well, this is the environment that I'm in, right? Um, also, there are, there are many, 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 many different types of financial instruments from shares to preference shares, bonds, futures, uh, you know, OTC, CFDs, all sorts of different financial instruments that have uh, different rules and different rights and different sort of, uh, you know, uh, properties that, you can potentially use or are potentially dangerous to you. So um, for example, an option gives you the right to buy or sell a certain number of shares or commodities or whatever it is at a certain price at a point in future. How is that different to a single stock future or a CFD? Uh, which one is better for you to trade? Which one do you understand more or which one more suits your your sort of personality type and the, the time frames in which you want to trade you know, are you going to be trading uh intraday eight to five and not hold positions overnight or are you going to take trades that last you know three to six weeks or three to six months or maybe five years and all of these different things will influence which instrument you trade right so it's important to understand the instruments before you start trading them you know, a lot of people sort of just jump on this, I want to trade CFDs, but they don't really know what it is that they're trading, or I want to trade Forex, and they don't really understand what they're doing, right? Uh, options is not as popular in South Africa as it is in the US, but we've seen a lot of people with this GameStop thing uh, and the whole Reddit saga, you know, trading options on GameStop, and only when these options expire worthless do you start seeing the Reddit post going, but what happened to all my money? I don't understand, because they didn't do the homework, to understand what instrument, what financial instrument they're trading, right? Um, and there are also various different market participants, people that, that interact with the market for different reasons. So there's long-term investors, there's speculators. So these are generally where the traders fit in. Uh, there are hedges. So people who have long positions and want to protect themselves from downside or, or external risk. Uh, there's obviously brokers, market makers, mutual funds or, or unit trusts as we call them in South Africa, hedge funds, high frequency trading firms, um, it's important to understand, you know, why, you know, what type of participant this is, why they participate, how they participate, what their motivations are behind buying or selling or whatever the case is. And then, you know, again, it's just building an understanding of the ecosystem in which we, in which we operate. Right. And that's, that's very important. Also, uh, I guess if there's one thing that you're going to remember from this today, I hope it's this, that. Trading gurus are not real, okay? Um, I'm not saying that there aren't any people out there that are doing great work. There are some courses that are absolutely worth doing, um, but these guys are not making YouTube videos 
or YouTube ads and making it seem exciting and posting pictures of them in Learjets, uh, trying to convince you to, to pay them a subscription fee, right? These courses are generally either very expensive um, or not very well known, if that makes sense, you know? Um, also, you know, when I started out, I did a course, uh, part of that course was a three year subscription. And as it turns out, I was actually paying off a piece of software that I didn't really need, right? I was, you know, I bought a, a charting package, but brokers today, you get free charting packages, you know, okay, there's an account fee uh, a lot of the time. And a lot of the time that account fee mostly just covers your, your sort of live dot data fees, right? So you've got to get the data from somewhere. Um, and a lot of that fee goes into that. Um, and you don't necessarily need to buy a fancy piece of software in order to get started, right? It's like, there are some really, really fancy uh, platforms and stuff that are out there, but they are generally incredibly expensive, right? So Bloomberg, for example, cost a cool two and a half thousand dollars a month. So is it worth getting that if you're just starting out? Yeah, probably not. It's like in the beginning, you're a kid driving around in a bumper car, just trying to figure out how the steering wheel and the pedal and the brake works. And now, you know, buying a Ferrari to, to, for a learner driver is not a good idea because they're going to crash it, right? So there's no real point in, in going out and buying these fancy uh, platforms and all sorts of stuff if you can basically just make use of the free tools that either your, your stockbroker will give you or are available on, on the internet, right? Um, also, no, no paid course is going to make you rich. Like I said, some courses are absolutely worth doing, but you have to then do the course for the right reasons or understand why you're doing it. If you do the course to learn uh, knowledge, you know, candlestick formations, trend lines, channel lines, uh, all sorts of, you know, oscillators and indicators and technical analysis or fundamental analysis, how to value a company, how to read a balance sheet, um, how to do a, a cash flow discount model. All those types of things are very valuable, right? So if you're going to do a course, do a course that focuses on passing knowledge rather than a course that focuses on passing a trading strategy that's going to work. Because I can guarantee you now, uh, and I think it was Charlie Munger that says this, if somebody worked out a way to make guaranteed 30% return every year, do you think really that he's going to be selling that formula or is he just going to take his own money and multiply and grow it by 30% every year for the rest of his life? You know, odds are it's going to be the latter. It's not going to be the former, right? So uh, the real skills that you need for training or for trading is going to come from books. It's going to come from experience of other people. And a lot of these books are sometimes very expensive, but um, they are worth it, right? So if you take, for example, a, a book that focuses on technical analysis uh, that forms part of the chartered market technician course material is like $200, right? It's, it's a lot of money for a book, let's be honest. But that book is going to add infinitely more value to you than some $200 technical analysis training video, you know? Um, because you can always go back and refer to the book and there's going to be way more knowledge in there than there is going to be in a weekend webinar or whatever the case is, right? Um, again, not to say that some court that, you know, all courses are bad. There are some that are, that offer a lot of value, but make sure that you're doing them for the, the knowledge transfer rather than the, you know, this is how to become a millionaire on the internet, or this is how to become a millionaire trading. Um, so yeah, so the real sort of path to freedom, this is something that I want to talk about because there's sort of these feedback loops that we go through as traders. Sorry, I just had to, uh, had to cough. Um, so there's sort of these feedback loops that we go through as traders. And this is something that is sometimes, um, you know, some bitter pills to swallow if you, if you will. Right. So I call this stuff the need money versus make money feedback loop. And, I don't know if that's the right name. If you can think of a, of a better one, please let us know. Um, but basically, there's sort of two cycles that, that people go through. So there's a destructive behavioral cycle or destructive uh, cycles and, and constructive cycles. And a lot of this stuff is sort of um, rooted in our current circumstance and also the way that our brains just work, right? And this, again, comes back to why the self-awareness component is so important. But I'm going to go through the first one. So the destructive behavior cycle and destructive emotional cycle sort of works like sort of works like this. So you kind of start off with, uh, you know, you're under some sort of financial pressure, 
um, maybe you just lost your job or maybe you're not making enough uh, you know income to cover your expenses or you know you're 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 looking at trading as a potential to alleviate this financial pressure so you're under some sort of a pressure and you're looking for a way out right uh, usually during this time you're feeling relatively hopeless and depressed or unhappy with your circumstance, right? So we start looking for something to alleviate your financial uh, uh, situation and you discover trading. So now you start making these real sort of reckless decisions um, from an emotional perspective, you start making these crazy high risk decisions without really considering what is happening, right? So you're taking way more risk than you should because you're hoping that this new venture is going to alleviate this financial pressure that you're under. What inevitably happens is you lose money that you can't um, afford to lose, right? And then you're in a worse financial position than you were before you started. So now you start feeling anxiety and stress and all sorts of stuff. Maybe you have to take loans to cover expenses or to pay for your losses, or you took a loan to start your trading account in the first place. And you get yourself again back into this loop of, you know, again, I'm under financial pressure. I need to find a way out. What am I going to do? Man, if I can just get this one trade right, I can make 50 grand in one trade. It's going to solve all my problems. And it's just this feedback loop that just goes absolutely nowhere. That digs you deeper and deeper and deeper in, right? So a feedback loop that's a bit more uh, positive. And this is something that I find that people who are successfully trading and have been doing so for some time generally try to generally sort of live within this this loop this feedback loop right so it starts off with a sense of financial security and confidence of knowing that um that things are that you're okay right you don't necessarily need to be out there trying to find new ways of of alleviating any sort of pressure because you don't have any pressure on you right i don't know guys it's raining here i don't know if you can still hear me very clearly um I'm hoping that you can. If you can't, please just put up your hand, I guess. No, audio is uh, can... coming fine. We're not here in the rain at all. Okay, great. Um, so if you're sort of operating from the space of like security and confidence, instead of looking for a way to alleviate your financial pressure, you've got a more opportunistic mindset and you're looking for opportun opportunities that you can capitalize on rather than for things that'll take your pain away, right? Um, so you're operating more from a space of curiosity and optimism rather than from a space of sort of desperation and anxiety, right? In these circumstances, you tend to be more patient. You tend to be more thorough in your uh, sort of research and analysis. And you tend to make more, you know, well-considered or more thoroughly thought out decisions. Um, when you do that, things tend to go well. So you earn a little bit of profit from your risk. You can use that profit to invest into your longer term uh, sort of stuff, which reinforces your sense of security. And you can then go through this positive loop, looking for opportunities that you can capitalize on rather than looking to alleviate this, this pressure, right? So um, this I think is a very sort of important thing to try and, to try and sort of aspire to, if you will, or a, a loop that you should try and get yourself into. Um, and that all starts with this, this first one, right? And this is something I really, I wish I knew in the beginning, because when I started trading, man, I risked everything. I had to pay, I had to sell assets to pay margin calls and stuff. It was really very hairy in the beginning. And it took a long time for me to sort of really get that, um, I need to think in terms of creating wealth and security rather than in how am I gonna make money, right? Um, so we've got to change the way we think. If we wanna do this, uh, for a living or for a hobby or for a side gig or whatever the case to make a little bit of extra money or because we think it's fun, we have to think, uh, we have to change the way that we think about the world, right? So the first thing we have to get used to is delayed gratification. You know, instant gratification is the source of most of our financial problems because man, we want those new shoes or man, I need to buy this car or oh, man, I need this right now. And I tend to make terrible decisions when I'm like that. So I go take a loan or I, you know, max out my credit card or whatever the case is, because I want instant gratification. I want it now rather than saving up for it uh, and getting it later. Right. So delayed gratification is sort of something that we have to really drill into ourselves uh, from the beginning. Right. We've got to teach ourselves to think in decades rather than in days. 
a lot of us are sort of stuck in this space where we think only about now or only about next week or only about you know a year from now or whatever the case is and we've really got to think in decades because to make money on the market takes a long time uh one a long time to learn to be an active trader or a successful active trader and two from an investment perspective you know the real money is actually made in earning dividends and accumulating capital gain and that kind of stuff right um so a nice way to think about it is if you look at like you know the great wall of china it's one of the greatest works in all of human history you can see it from space it is this amazing achievement but it is made up of millions and millions and millions of small blocks or bricks right um so we have to get used to the idea of we're not trying to build a monument in a day we should be focused on just making every brick as well as we can right so the bricks in this case are your individual trades and the monument is the wealth that you accumulate over time by stacking together a series or millions and millions of good trades right um and consistency of thought and action is what creates this result right so you have to consistently remind yourself it's a 10-year plan it you know i have to to i can't be seeking for instant gratification so you've got to really sort of change the way your brain works a little bit to come in line with how it needs to think in order to to consistently and successfully interact with markets right or trade markets um so at the beginning and this is the part nobody wants to hear is you must first save money and you must first invest that money and you must first build sort of a a foundation on which you then can afford to take risk right and once you feel comfortable with your sort of financial situation then you can start to trade so everybody sort of wants to come in and says well i don't have a hundred thousand rand in a savings account to start trading i've only got this five thousand bucks truth is five thousand rand is not enough it's it's just not right um yes there are maybe stories about somebody that turned five thousand rand into five million and whatever and now he's probably selling a course but the truth is you have to start with a foundation right i'll say this again 0.24 percent of people make it trading and by making it i define that as become a professional full-time trader don't have a job all i do is trade right a very small percentage of people make that and those people are almost always in a space where they don't need to do that for a living it took them 20 years to get there and they in the process have built up a big enough asset base that if they stopped today they would be fine for at least a couple of years right um so generally only once you know that you can sustain yourself without the need for income uh for a relatively long period of time do you sort of grow the confidence and the patience to actually be able to make it successful a success of this right otherwise you're going to be stuck in this negative feedback loop the whole time always short of money i've only got five grand i'm gonna you know i need and I, I can't afford to lose it i need to make money i'm you know boom stuck in this feedback loop but if you actually sort of just spend the time building and and creating wealth for yourself and thinking in terms of you know thinking in decades thinking that this is a long-term journey i have to start at the beginning uh, and that beginning is by building you know a savings account first you must save before you can invest that is the first um that is the first step right so my little wealth creation matrix or pyramid <laughs> um and basically you know at the bottom of this is where you where you start even if you want to be a trader and you want to sort of you know you want the excitement and the freedom and all the stuff that comes with trading you must first build yourself a dude in the sense of knowing that i'm going to be okay right um and yes that's the first step and yes that takes a long time to get there because the only way to get capital is to save it and that is boring i i hate to break it to you during this period though while you're saving up this capital base or building out this capital base this is also a time that you can use to learn right and to really learn not, not um you know 
you know, I'm talking about reading books and studying and and talking to other traders and primarily, you know, like a book like uh, Unknown Market Wizards, for example, is enormously valuable because it teaches you, gives you the insight into how people who've been doing this for the last 20 years, how they think and how they do things, right? So if you're starting out, start saving up. I mean, uh, save for a, for a specific purpose, right? You say, you get a savings account, you put some money in it every month, and you save into that until, and even if it takes you three years, use that time to study, right? Um, from here, it sort of becomes important to see the bigger picture. So once you have a, a sort of decent enough capital base that you feel comfortable with and you feel, okay, this is actually providing me with a sort of a safety net. I've now at least got one year's worth of income here. Uh, from there, you sort of want to start building a thematic medium term portfolio. So this is where you can now start taking a little bit more risk. Um, and you can sort of start backing ideas that you think are going to work out in the next couple of years or the next couple of months or whatever the case is. So sort of longer term stuff. Above that, you want a liquid safety net asset. So um, I know, uh, you know, Christia, for example, from Just One Lap, always talks about, well, not always, but has a few times spoken about this emergency fund and the importance of having an emergency fund. You know, your car tire breaks down or whatever. You don't now want to have to pull out money from your investments um, in order to, 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 replace the wheel on your car um so you want to sort of have that sort of emergency fund or liquidity buffer first right and this is i guess where your sense of opportunism comes from because now you've got a bit of extra cash that you can use for stuff you don't really need it it's there in case of emergency but if a chance that's really good comes along um you know you've got the ability to take that opportunity and once you have all of these in place then you can start a trading account Right, because now you've got money that you can afford to lose. I can now take five grand and start trading because I've got 150 underneath me, or I've got 100 or, or even 50,000 Rand underneath me that provides me with a sense of safety and security. And I know that I can afford to lose five grand and it's not going to kill me. Right. So you kind of want to then start building this pyramid. This is your first step. And this is where I went wrong. Right. Um, I started off working in a bank, I started buying shares at a whole bunch of things. And then I got a, a gig at a, a, a day trading uh, firm and I sold all my long-term stuff. I put all the cash in the trading account and I lost it in four months. And, you know, that's one of the things that I go, wow, I wish I actually knew that at that time I wasn't, and you know, I, people told me and I didn't listen to them, um, but they told me you're not ready. And I wouldn't listen to them because I wanted, to, you know, the glory and the fun and the, the riches of being a trader. And these guys are making five grand a day. And, you know, if they can do it, I can do it. And, you know, the truth is the reason they can make five grand a day is because they don't need to make five grand a day. Um, so first build your capital base before you, before you really get, uh, you know, involved in active speculative trading. Um, another sort of concept I think is that freedom demands discipline, right? We want to be free and we want to live our lives on our own terms and we want to do whatever we want, whenever we want. And that's cool and all, but the reality is that we have to be very honest with ourselves around uh, you know, what we can and cannot do and what we can and cannot afford and what we can uh, you know, in the decisions that, that we make have, have consequences, right? If we take our life savings and we lose it all on a series of bad trades, that has serious long-term ramifications, right? Uh, so if you want to do this, it's like, it's a very disciplined lifestyle. If I look at the people that I know that are successful traders, and I'm, I'm very fortunate to know a few of them. I mean, hardly any of them drink, right? Uh, they all live healthy lifestyles. They all go to bed early. They all wake up really early. They, uh, you know, they eat healthy. They have an entire sort of lifestyle around being balanced, right? They get exercise. They, they're constantly learning. They're constantly reading books. I mean, all of the good traders that I know, when Unknown Market Wizards was published, within the same week they bought it because they want to learn they want to keep learning they want to keep sort of you know improving on their skill set and that's a real sort of lifestyle or or core belief that we need to instill in ourselves is that we have to live balanced lives you can't go and so it comes back to that whole thing like you can't go out and have a puzza thursday and get home at two in the morning and sit at my desk and at nine o'clock and think i'm going to make money that day because my brain is not going to work the way it's supposed to I need to be in a good mental space. I need to be awake. I need to be fresh. I need to be well-fed and well-fueled 
before I can really do this, right? And and daily routine is a very, very important thing, right? So some guys, you know, if they uh, get to their desk at half past nine, they've missed the whole day. They won't trade because, you know, normally they are reading from 6.30 in the morning until the market opens. And by the time the market opens, they're prepared. This morning, something went wrong. My routine's off. I can't do this. So think of it like professional sport, right? Um, a Formula One driver that didn't get a good night's sleep is not going to win the race. In fact, he's probably going to crash. And the amount of pressure and stress that trading can put on you, uh, it's very similar, right? So you have to sort of think of, a, a, you kind of got to, if you want to do this, it really changes the way that your whole life works and your whole lifestyle. And I think, you know, one of the one of the major things is that most of the successful traders that I know, it's 90% the way that they think and only 10% are things that they know, right? They know when they're upset. They know how to calm themselves down. They know how their brain starts to make different decisions when they're upset and they, they understand themselves, right? There's no amount of an analysis that's ever going to replace um, solid thinking strategies and, and self-awareness. And yeah, I guess that's, that's really, uh, that's really that. Petri, uh, there we go. Petri, appreciate that. that was excellent. I uh, enjoyed that. A bunch of questions coming through. Folks, if you've got questions, uh, stick them in, 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 in the, the, the Q&A box. We've certainly got some time here. Storm seems to have passed. Uh, the first one, and I'm going to throw that one at you, Petri, because it's the really hard one. Uh, are markets going to crash again in April? <laughs> we were talking about this just before yeah. this started. Um, I hope so. <laughs> I'll be honest. I do hope so. Um, <laughs> I hope so because I want the opportunity to buy stuff, right? Um, it's very hard to to justify jumping in the market now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with long term intentions. So again, then I guess this comes back to that pyramid thing, right? Think long term, you know, think in decades. If there's an opportunity for us to buy stuff, if the markets come off twenty or thirty percent, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, do I think it's going to happen? I don't know. It is possible, but I guess we have to see how much uh, how much more upside there is going to be once we once we get a fresh 1.9 trillion dollars in the system, right? Um, yeah. The reality right. is that the, the COVID is passing. Um, the world is sort of waking up again and, and coming back to business and sort of returning to some semblance of normality. In about a year from now, we should be able to travel freely again, which is going to be great for all sorts of industry. So there's a strong case to be made for, hey, things can go back to normal and markets can keep going up. I do, however, think that some companies are just trading in sectors and tech, for example, is just trading at valuations that are just absolutely unreasonable. But it doesn't mean that it comes down, right? So do we crash? Flip a coin. I don't know. Yeah. Um, if we do, that's actually a very good opportunity for us. It'll be very scary, make no mistake, but we have to realize like, you know, big crashes like that, like 2008, for example, I mean, that was a generational type opportunity for people to get into the market. If you look at what happened to Sasol, it traded down to, into, 20, into the twenties, right? That was a huge opportunity. Um, and it got really scary when it was down there, but I wasn't one of them. Other people were brave enough to take the opportunity and they've been rewarded handsomely for that. So um crashes are not necessarily bad yeah i mean i managed to, i picked up some some equity in in the 08 09 um not because i was smart but just because standard bank paid your bonus twice a year and i was working there and um and i think the lagger was up 150 percent in two years or three years or whatever the case was um and i bought and it went lower i bought what uh september 08 it went lower i bought december 08 it went lower and i bought march 08 and finally that was the bottom um, but to your point, when we started this presentation, NASDAQ was red for the year to date, and NASDAQ has now turned green. And in fact, as I oh, say wow. that, as I say that, the S&P has gone green as well. Um, there's a lot of cash out there. Question coming from Tabo. He says, uh, so he's got two. Let me go to the first one first. Um, in terms of hold the trade for a while, perhaps holding a trade for like a month or so, I found that the fees for overnight funding is quite a sum. He's not wrong with that. I mean, uh, if, if you're in the, so the CFD space, essentially, those who are wondering what he means, you're basically 
you, you've put down the 5,000 per three mentions, but your broker's lent you another 45,000. You're paying interest on that 45,000. Um, but per three, I mean, that, that interest does, I mean, it costs, but it, I mean, it, it shouldn't be even over a month. It shouldn't be onerous, surely. Yeah, so I mean, it depends on what the the interest funding rate is. Um, mm -hmm. Generally, it's like SAFI plus three percent or SAFI plus three point five. Um, so it should be around seven to seven and a half percent, I think, at the moment. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you hold it for a year, you've lost seven percent of the value of whatever you've bought. So I'm assuming yeah. that Tabo, you're probably trading CFD, right? So um, you put a ten percent deposit down, and the rest of the position value you you basically finance. You, you're loaning that money, right? So, if you are going to be holding positions for longer periods of time, and you're happy to hold it for you know six months, then maybe consider trading it or buying it rather as an equity rather than a CFD. So the downside is you're going to pay slightly higher brokerage because now you've got to cover securities transfer tax, settlements, mm -hmm. straight, a whole bunch of other fees. So the brokerage rate is generally higher, but you don't have that interest cost um so i think if you if you do a bit of a cost benefit analysis for example um you know through one of their renew platforms if you try to cfd it's 50 rand minimum if you try to equity it's 150 rand minimum but if you've bought you know if you so by the time you've paid 100 rands worth of interest on your position uh it would have already made more sense to buy the share just a normal share so okay let's take because you don't get access to gearing but you don't pay that that fee and i think this is goes back to understanding the instruments that that we're trading right what are the pros and cons of these various instruments you know cfds are, are cheaper to trade but by nature they're shorter term trading instruments uh not really designed to be held for for very long periods of time yep and that's exactly what i did with my my lazy trading is is because my trade durations would be i mean i held it the indie for i think four years um and and if i'd been paid in funding i would have been killed it would have cost you what 28 percent yeah look it was fun that's I mean, the I, entire yeah i made a hundred and something but still i, I just I, I just actually bought the 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 the, the, the etf and i take your point it's, it's a cost analysis so trouble's follow-up is then um uh, uh how can one uh in future turn trading into a business regulatory requirements as opposed to just making profits for oneself um and i'm going to give a short short answer and then petri you can as well, because obviously you're doing that with Therenia. I, I mean, so there's two aspects from it. One is where you sort of trade in a PTY. There's your 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 benefits to it are relatively mute. Your tax benefits are zero. Treasury has long since shut that down. But I think you're taking this whole steps further and talking about sort of perhaps becoming a broker uh, and getting Cat 1 and Cat 2 and et cetera uh, uh, licenses. Petri, you've obviously got a bunch more to add to that. Yeah, so I guess it depends on your your intention, right? So some people don't really want a business, right? Um, in my case, obviously I do, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think what happens is there's there's sort of two options that that open up to you uh, once you realize like you know this is actually something that I can do. Is one if you start doing it with more capital, you can make more money, right? So if, for example, I have a million rand in my trading account, sure, I can make some money. But if I can charge a management fee and a performance fee and get a billion rand to manage, hmm, that's that's much bigger income, right? Um, so that's the goal for me, mm -hmm. right? Um, is to build up to like, you know, fund management and that type of stuff because you can really make a significant sort of business out of this. If you want to go that route, there's a lot of regulatory stuff that you have to go through um the exams are not that expensive i mean they are quite pricey i think the, i don't know what they I mean, they were much cheaper when i did them when that was also like a decade ago um but you go to saifm.co.za that's the south african institute of financial markets there's a whole bunch of exams you have to write there there are exams called rpe exams or registered person exams um you have to do the introduction to financial markets one and the regular regulation and ethics one and the equity market as the basis of um, you know where you start. After that, it becomes a bit more product specific. So if you want to uh, you know do provide financial services in derivatives, there's a derivative exam or forex or uh, you know agricultural futures or whatever. There's a whole bunch of different ones. So 
there is some guidance I think on the website as well as to which exams you need for for which job right um, and then you also have to do what's called RE exams uh, and you can do these through um, you know one of the sort of major compliance companies I think I did mine through Moonstone uh, these are essentially exams that focus on the uh, Financial Advisory and Intermediary Services Act and the Financial Markets Act um, and this is basically just the rules around what you can and cannot do, what you are allowed to say, what is financial advice. Um, you know, for example, I'm licensed to trade in derivatives, but I'm not licensed to trade in agricultural derivatives. So I can't be giving you advice on, you know, corn futures mm -hmm. when I'm actually not licensed to do that because I didn't write those exams, right? Oh, that's um, so that's a good sort of route to go. Um, and you can choose either. I mean, you, you, know, you can become a broker, right? Um, or you can, if you're really sort of ambitious, uh, you can go the route of, of starting a firm. Uh, there are some rules around that as well. So for example, in order to obtain a license, you need to have uh, recognized qualifications. So these RPEs are, are some of them. Uh, there are also uh, experience requirements. So you have to work in a financial services provider and be supervised for something like three years before you are con deemed fit and proper. Uh, and then you have to, uh, you know, there's fit and proper requirements, like you can't have a criminal record and you can't, you know, so no drinking and driving because you'll lose your license. Uh, so there's lots of, lots of, but um, they're, they're not, I mean, they're onerous, but they're not insurmountable. Yeah, and I quite like, I, so I did the RPEs and I, I actually did all of them. I, I think there's seven or there eight of them or, so I, that's not quite all of them, but yes. yeah. And I just did them because they, they made me smarter about stuff to your point earlier that, you know, did I directly need to know that in order to, to trade? No. Did it make me smarter? Yeah. And smarter is always wins up. Smarter is better. Yeah. And it, 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 it's actually, you know, those RP exams give a huge amount of information um, and are very, very good. I actually think that, um, you know, some of the, some of the clients that join us or whatever the case, um, you know, that's recommended reading for them. Yeah. Uh, you know, those PDFs uh, or those books um, are very, very insightful. You know, just things like how does the central order book of the JSE work? Yeah. Yeah. And that is, that's helpful to know, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even if you're not going to be a broker, it's just a useful thing to know just so that you know stuff. A great question coming. Um, and I, I get this bunches and I'm going to give a short answer and then, and then I'll hand over to you, Petri. Uh, can I still trade and have a full time job? How can I structure my life to be successful? I'm going to give that answer from two directions. Firstly is don't be a slave to the market. Make the market the slave to you. Uh, don't believe that you can work uh, eight to five and then trade from five to midnight. That's not going to work either. Um, don't believe that you can trade, uh, work eight to five and trade eight to five because you will lose your job and your money. Um, but can you structure your, your, your trading around a work environment? You absolutely can. You know, my, my lazy trading, I got that down to about uh, 20 minutes of effort per week, um, which, which, you know, means that you're not, <clears throat> to Petri's point, you know, trying to burn the candle from both ends. You're not trying to be a crazy, um, but you've structured it. And I looked at it and, you know, I did some day trading. Uh, it, it was profitable. I just didn't enjoy it. It was, it was, it was mind numbingly boring to be perfectly honest. Um, and I wanted to go and, you know, I wanted to do enjoyable stuff with my life. Um, and so I, I moved my trading into situations where actually I'm, I'm spending very little time in front of the charts. And that's not completely true because I watch charts because I love them, because it's my job. I do TV. I got to know what I'm talking about. Um, but my trading time is is maybe an hour a, a, a month and 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 there are other folks out there who are spending 60 hours you can design it and say this is how much time i want to give to the market um, and still have a life and a family and a job and a hobby and a weekend and everything else uh peter your thoughts on full-time and and trading yeah so i i i sort of agree with a lot of a lot of what you said right um i think there are so, okay, so, the, you know, I, I said a few times, and I'm actually going to unpause this thing. I said a few times that, um, you know, a very, very small percentage of traders actually make it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there are some traders out there who can sort of consistently make uh, a profit, um, knowing that 
you know, like while they have a, a different job. I think mm -hmm. the difference is that, you know, they're in a situation where they're, and you know, trading while you have a job is obviously you know, where most of us are going to start, right? Yeah. Um, and it's probably a better place to start off as well, because if you can build yourself a little routine where, you know, in the morning, you maybe, you know, do some reading, do some research, whatever, prepare for the market open. The market opens at nine o'clock every day. Uh, so, you know, you have to place your orders between 8.30 and 9. Uh, you can maybe keep one eye on the market until about 10, 11 o'clock or, you know, during the course of the day. But you're sort of rooted in this routine that I don't really make trading decisions during the course of the day. I make my decisions uh, at the beginning or at the end of the day. And you know, let the market play out as it may during the course of the during the course of the day. A lot of people can do that, um, and you know, they're not maybe these full-time traders who I class as, or in this presentation at least, classed as made it uh, because you know they sit in front of their computers all day every day and trade. Um, but they can consistently make profit, right? Um, and there are quite a few people who actually fall into that category. So the 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 research paper I was talking about is actually. I'd encourage you to go to the to the Herinia website and look under presentations. It's called the realities of trading. Um, and uh, uh, you know those those were particularly tracking day traders, right? So these are people that traded every single day, um, which is not necessarily the same as someone who I would class as a swing trader or a medium term trader, right? So this is someone who thinks like, yes, you know, there's a nice formation here on Aspen. There's a good sort of fundamental backdrop. Uh, you know, I can buy it here and if it goes to 170, uh, you know, that'll be target reached. And if it goes to 130, that'll be stopped out. So there's a nice one to three risk reward ratio here. You know, this trade is going to probably take three or four months to play out. I can take that trade. Yeah. Um, so sure, you're not going to make a million bucks a week doing that. Um, but it is absolutely possible to do that profitably, right? Yeah. So I did. I mean, my hack was I moved to weekly charts um which meant i only really worried about the charts on sunday um and then i trade all the futures pre-open pre the equity open between 8 30 and 9 um, and that's all the time that my trading gets I, I don't trade anything beyond that at all um folks i see we're hitting time and i, I don't want to overdraw that a couple of questions about the presentation it will be on uh, uh just one lap in herenia uh, i'll have it up later this evening uh paul's asking about do you draw your own candlestick before you get in the trade uh, just if, if I'm understanding you correctly, Paul, uh, it's going to be drawn. Your software package will generate it for you. Go to a website such as TradingView.com, uh, uh, and, and they've got the candlesticks. They generate that for you. The second half is how do you determine your entry? Uh, and that pair three is the proper hard question. <laughs> yeah. So um, okay. So on the on the draw your own candlestick thing. So. You can. It's actually something that I tried to do for a while uh, was to draw my own charts. Um, mostly that was a sort of a discipline uh, and and learning thing for me, right? Um, it is immensely time consuming though, but there are some people that I follow on Twitter that draw that hand draw their own charts as well. And you yeah, know, okay. it's just what some people prefer, right? Um, I prefer these days to have a fancy trading view account <laughs> that does all of that for me. Yeah. Determining the uh, uh, the entry points and exit points of trades. This is sort of more focused on your uh, your trading strategy. So there's quite a few different things that go into that. Um, I think um, if you like, maybe you can drop me an email and we can we can do a call about it. But uh, you know you can also go and have a look on the presentations. Um, it's under you. It's under HCA Trading Useful Resources Presentations on the Herenia.co.za website. Um, there is something called building your strategy or something to that. It's one. It's actually a power hour also. So it'll be, also be on on just on lap as well as YouTube, um, and that sort of focuses on um, how to build a trading strategy. So essentially, what you do is you just uh, you have to create a set of rules for yourself, like a bunch of like if statements essentially. So um, for example, I want to buy um you know gold fields or, or rmi is a, is a good example rmh was a good example it was had resistance at around 30 or whatever the case is and my entry point would be once the market closes above around 30 the next morning i'll buy it mm -hmm. right so that would then be like a rule so you take a rule-based approach and you um you know you have to do a bit of sort of homework around which 
things you want as part of your rule set. So for me, for example, I want to see uh, the stochastic first move up through, first the stochastic and the signal line cross, that's one signal, then move up through 20, that's another signal, move up through 50, that's another signal, move up through 80, that's another signal. Now I've got a full set of buy signals on that particular oscillator. MACD line, have a cross above zero, that's a full set of buy signals on a MACD. Then on the price chart, I want to see price take out a significant resistance level, and I want to see a trade above short-term moving averages. And on the break of a significant resistance level, that's my entry point. So you can make it as complicated or simple as you please, right? Um, and that really is sort of around your own trading style, the time frame in which you're trading, um, the instrument that you're trading. There's a whole bunch of things that go into that, uh, into developing that sort of strategy for yourself. A last question coming through uh, is how much money do you want need to start with? So this is a this is a hard question to answer, right? So I think I spent a fair amount of time chatting about, um, you know, you need to have this asset base underneath you before you can do this. And it sounds very much like that you need money to make money argument, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that I know is something that a lot of people don't really want to hear. But the truth is, you know, if you have only 5,000 Rand, for example, and you trade Forex with that, generally Forex on a conservative account is geared 50 times, Yeah. right? So for a thousand bucks, you can get 500,000 Rand's worth of risk exposure. So now that's crazy, right? Absolutely crazy because if anything goes wrong, if that thing moves two percent, you're dead. You're all your five grand is gone, right? So okay, fine. Um, trade less geared instruments. Uh, so let's trade CFD. Now the trade, now the risk, now the gearing is ten times, but it's a bit more expensive to trade CFD because it's like fifty rand minimum, right? Or zero point two percent of the value of the transaction. So now, if I've got five grand and I want to buy ten thousand rands worth of stuff, it's fifty rand brokerage. So now my brokerage is proportionally big compared to the, the trades that I'm, you know, the amount of profit that I'm looking to make on, on any given trade that goes right or wrong. Um, and also what happens is with smaller amounts of money, it's very difficult to manage risk. I mean, you want to risk, say, 2% of your capital or 5% of your capital if you're aggressive on any given trade. You know, risking 2% of 5,000 Rand, yeah, you know, that's your brokerage fee to get in and out of your trade. Yeah, yeah. So you, you can't lose, right? So what I would suggest is to not really start with less than 50,000 Rand. Um, in fact, I would encourage you to save. Um, and, you know, another hard lesson, and I'm sorry to say it, if you can't save a thousand Rand a month, you should not be trading derivatives, right? Um, it's just, you shouldn't be taking risk if you, if you can't afford to save a thousand rand a month. And if you, if, even if you can't afford to save a thousand rand a month, if you can save 500 rand a month, fine, then save that money until you have a, a capital base that you know, okay, I've got 50 grand now, I can now take 10,000 rand and I can risk it in the market. And if I lose it, you know what? I still have 40 grand left. Yeah. So I agree um, with you. I think, I think and I can adequately manage with. risk. Yeah, proper risk. Yeah. Take small positions. Yep. We'll park that there, folks. We've run out of time a bit, uh, but I appreciate everyone's time. Petri, that was excellent. Really appreciate your time. Uh, it will be up on just one lap later this evening, and then I'll send the links to Petri. He'll put it on herenia.coza. Uh, if you head to herenia.coza, of course, you'll find all of their uh, other presentations that Petri has done. Um, and you can get hold of Petri either via his website or on Twitter. Uh, Petri, thank you very, very much. Uh, Matthew, appreciate your time in the background there from the JSC. Uh, ladies and gents and everyone, have a good evening further. Stay safe.